Welcome you all back here. Um, we are about to start the, uh, one of the last panels, um, and this is institution in the era of social turbulence. As you may notice, this is quite a compensated uh, panel, especially if we compare it to yesterday's. You know, yesterday was all women, one man, so today we, we are in the position to compensate not the panel, but the whole thing. So you have to think in a larger framework, you know, to look at this as a, as a yeah, <laughs> and decide what is better. <laughs> All right. So um, what I will do is, uh, by way of introduction here, is uh, try to unpack um, the, what is uh, lurking behind uh, the notion of, uh, or the idea of turbulence. And by way of introduction, I've been thinking that I would like to share with you um, like five, six minutes uh, clip, film clip, from the last film by Roberto Rossellini, a film that is rarely listed in his filmography. So that in 1977, just two months before he died, he actually finished a, an astonishing film about uh, Le Centre Just Pompidou. He was commissioned to film the new institution, and that man, the father of neorealism, who has actually been engaged in the last years of his life with uh, sort of a, an ambitious project, to kind of an encyclopedic project to summarize the humanist culture through film and television, he arrived at the Pompidou as the very last uh, monument to that uh, aspiration to democratize and make culture accessible for, all, for everybody. But at the end, uh, Rossellini delivers a very skeptical document, and um, it is really uh, quite a remarkable uh, piece, and it is also worth noticing that the Pompidou who had commissioned this film, they said, thank you very much, uh, Monsieur Rossellini, but we are not going to use it. So the film remained almost, uh, you know, unknown for a long time. And then when I came across uh, Jacques Anclot, uh, the producer, um, he just told me he had this material, so we started to revise it, and then in 2012, I presented like a small project with the newly digitized uh, film that uh, Rossellini finished like uh, the month before he died, so it's still a film that he had to do some touches. And uh, I also recuperated all the, the making of, because the production of the film was made with uh, a bunch of uh, 68 uh, like one of those uh, small uh, companies that emerged out in the, in the in 68, and also 35 hours of sound recording uh, within the museum. So it, it was really a remarkable enterprise. I would say it's like institutional critique uh, uh, at its best through uh, the sort of uh, language of uh, cinema. Think, I mean, you have to bear in mind that the photographer for that film was uh, Nestor Almendros, the, the, the usual photographer for maybe uh, for Scorsese. So, this is a film that um, I would like to use as a sort of um, an invocation of uh, what is it like to consider the institution as a place that can open up to, uh, you know, identify, recognize, or even sort of generate this um, turbulence. Uh, by the way, the word turbulence, I mean, everybody will uh, admit that it is a term that is rather connected to the climate uh, sort of, uh, you know, I mean, language. But we often use it for social turbulence. So there is a certain displacement of the term. And what we will try to do with this panel also is to bring it back to its original sort of identity as a turbulence that by being caused by natural phenomena is no less sort of uh, intriguing and uh, it's not, it's, I mean, it's, it's also causing a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, like uh, upheavals in a social field. Um, 
I like to say as a bit of a, as a sort of a statement before I also introduce uh, the panelists, my friends here, uh, that, that I do think that the museum is a site of conflict. And if it is not a site of conflict, conflict, one has to really look for it or identify it. So the museum, uh, we start, uh, we will start from the premise that the museum or the institution, it it is also an agent to identify lines of conflict, sites of conflict. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in a way, I mean, uh, it, it, it may end up looking like a paradox, and uh, we know how also museums and institutions have ended up looking like those Florentine museums, you know? I mean, you look at the changes, at the turbulences, at the turmoils on the street through the glass of the window to the palace, you know? having behind all these grandiose uh, cultural prediction, uh, production. So this is one possibility also. But I think that uh, within the table we have different provenances and geopolitical frameworks and also it's different the scales of, uh, you know, in terms of the different agencies. Uh, next to me sitting uh, Pouja Sud, and she's director of uh, KHOJ, uh, which is an international artist association, an artist-led uh, uh, registered society, as uh, she introduces uh, in the in the leaflet, and I will not go far with these introductions because it would be silly to just repeat. Um, then uh, farther on uh, the left, um, Sebastian, he works as a chief curator of the Museum of Modern Art. Still, in, in still never, still nothing has changed. Since nothing is permanent. Nothing is yeah. permanent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still, exactly. <laughs> no new proposals. No new. <laughs> I thought you would change uh, yeah, overnight. Like kidnapped or something. The new left. Yeah. Yeah. The new left, yeah, 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 still. Coming. <laughs> we also have uh, Nabil Ahmed. Um, he's a London-based researcher, writer, art educator, and uh, he will actually end uh, the different, uh, the, all the uh, interventions we have planned by bringing back the term to, uh, to the environment, climate crisis, and the ecocide, so that, I mean, we will somehow perform a philological uh, investigation of what the term turbulence can, can mean. And next to me is uh, Thomas Boutot. He's a Paris-based artist, right, uh, sorry, writer, creator, and uh, publisher. And um, recently, he started uh, Paraguay, Press together with Francois Piron. And yeah, and larger group of uh, persons. Okay. So if you like, we could start by watching these five, six minutes. And uh, what you will see actually is not the, uh, not the film, but the making of. Uh, how Rossellini is actually planning to represent the moment the Pompidou is going to open the doors to a crowd, to the audience who is waiting there. And uh, so, okay, then maybe we can go on and, and say a little bit more after we watch these five, six uh, minutes. GG, ça commence là. Bon, je continuerai très lentement à panoramiquer. Très, très, très lentement à panoramiquer, voilà. Attention, il y a un câble qui, qui tient un peu là. Voilà. Alors, voilà, serré à présent. Attention, ça se débranche. 55. Non, non, 75. 75. 75. Vous faites le défilé. Les quatre. Alors, je les, je les laisse. Je les laisse passer. Vous les laissez ligne. passer et vous finissez. Arrêtez là avec le travelling. Ouais. Et vous finissez avec les quatre. Vous voyez Oui. Vous les faites passer, mais vous finissez avec les quatre. 
D'accord. Un moment comme ça, moi je vais être comme ça. Le moment que vous commencez à bouger, moi je, 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 je Le moment que vous commencez à aller en bas. D'accord. Moi, je vous ai Troisième. Alors, nous finissons au 55. Comme ça, nous n'avons pas la, la chose blanche de côté. Vous voyez Il y a tout, euh, tout vêtement épinglé. Qu'est-ce qu'il y a ici Ah oui, oui, oui. Si on est avec le 35, vous l'avez toujours. D'accord. Comme ça, on l'élimine. Donc on reste au 55. Alors on est au non, 60, on, on va est... en 35. Et quand vous êtes en train d'arriver là-bas, je vais au Ah d'accord. Ah oui, oui, je comprends. Donc, euh, bon, le vêtement, le vêtement épinglé, on l'aura un peu pendant le... Mais à la fin, on n'aura plus. Tout cela, vous vous laissez. C'est le moment que vous remontez qui se tente là. Moi, je suis en 55. Oui, non. Oh, oh, je... Qu'est-ce que c'était, 55 55 à la fin. Ah. Bon, bon. T'as jugé Alors, attends. Bon. Il faut virer tout ça, c'est dans le champ, tout ça. Alors, euh, vous avez là-bas un reflet terriblement fort. Hein. Non, non, c'est bien assez pour moi. Ah bah ben, ils ont fait quelque chose. Clap. Quatrième. Et ça tu le sais à, 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 la, à la seconde près Non, en fonction de. Non, mais je le sais, parce que je le garde dans la caméra avant. Je me fais les coupes, et puis je me synchronise sur ce mouvement. Pas difficile. Non, le problème, c'est qu'on tu... ne voit rien sur ta machine. Non, mais il faut... Moi, je vais <rire> <'ai... rire> faire au départ, j'avais fait une petite... un petit viseur comme ça, pour voir moi mmh. aussi. Hein. Oui. Mais c'est compliqué, il y a un tas de câbles. Qui... Mais quelques temps que tu emploies ces choses-là, tu ne sais pas quoi. Je crois que le, le seul problème, alors ça c'est pour vous Roberto, c'est que maintenant qu'on commence un jeudi et non pas mardi, ouais. le jour du musée vide, euh, tourner... Mais nous avons toujours le vide le matin. Oui, mais le vide le matin n'est jamais d'abord complètement vide, parce que Bobo n'est pas terminé d'une part. Deuxièmement, parce que le matin, il y a toujours des groupes scolaires, des, des visites exceptionnel entre guillemets, qui fait qu'on n'est jamais complètement vide. Mais enfin, je pense que... On, un peu. on va s'arranger. Donc, si vous voulez, je crois que le seul inconvénient, ça va, et ça va être donc la journée la plus dure, c'est carrément dès jeudi, où on commencerait par le forum, ce que nous nous appelons vulgairement le rez-de-chaussée, mm -hmm. et où il y a quand même, je crois, beaucoup de choses à faire vide, ouais. entre guillemets, mm -hmm. toujours. D'autant plus que maintenant il y a une nouvelle exposition sur l'imagerie politique qui oui, important. va sûrement vous intéresser. Oui. Il va donc rajouter des plans et à 3 heures, ben, on ouvre les grilles du zoo et la meute rentre. Alors et là, nous faisons la rentrée. Oui, alors là c'est. Donc il faudrait normalement avoir fini tout le rez-de-chaussée vide, disons à 2 heures, pour avoir le temps de permuter l'axe caméra comme vous le souhaitiez quand on est vous êtes. Quand vous êtes au sommet de l'escalier, vous revenez sur la porte. Oui, vous revenez sur la porte rapidement. Un peu comme ça. Ah, J'ai été beaucoup plus à gauche que tout à l'heure, c'est une façon que je n'avais pas eu. Corrigez comme, comme quand je coupe au milieu. Vous en faites pas, corrigez comme vous voulez. 
Arriva il riscaglieri. Je reviens sur la foule, petit à petit sur l'escalier. Euh, on resserre et on reste sur l'escalier. Encore un peu, on va serrer toujours. L'escalier est juste entré dans le mur. On peut resserrer encore maintenant. Si vous voulez. I think this is good enough and excuse the, the I mean for being it a bit long but I thought it was an interesting um, opportunity to reveal I mean how these crowds sort of um, storm into the museum and of course this is not the usual occupation uh, of a museum you know when they voluntarily sort of occupy the museum uh, these are audiences uh, public visitors, uh, but the interesting thing is that this uh, crowd will be the subject of the film in, in Rossellini's uh, description of the Pompidou, and the basic description of these people is given by their demotic language, because they will not speak any specialized, sophisticated language. They will just say uh, stupid, silly things, I mean, uh, really banal, but these 35 hours of sound recording will be actually the lead of the film, uh, so much that uh, Rosalini merged uh, the sound and, and, and the uproar of the city, the ambient noise of the museum, the footsteps, the public announces. In fact, in the final film, when you see this sequence of the opening of the doors, Rosalini overlaps the conversation among the guards, and the guards tell each other, faites attention, faites attention, la foule qui monte. La foule qui monte, the crowd is going up. So the museum becomes, uh, before the eyes of, uh, of Rossellini, basically a machine to manage and monitor the crowd. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really would like to stick to that sort of ambivalent uh, perception of uh, the audience, the visitors, the crowd, the mob, the multitude. Mm -hmm. And in Latin, we should recall that turbulence, uh, it has the same root as turba, turba being also like a violent mass of people. I'd like to leave it here and um, give the word to my friend Sebastian. Okay. I hope you are happy with uh, <laughs> the second set of <laughs> my uh, footnotes and comments and uh, this time uh, I'm going to be like really down to earth, focused on certain local issues. I will introduce um, the current political situation in Poland, like not going in depth, but rather trying to analyze it in terms of our institutional, like daily institutional museum, museum work. And uh, in the end, I will introduce three terms, which are, I think, quite handy and at my it might open up a certain like discussion between us and 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 like between like, in the in the whole group so uh i would start from uh from a little film uh also uh which was a commission uh commission uh, uh, in 2000 2016 uh it's a little film. It's a little TV commercial, uh, which was which was produced by Pope L, uh, African American artist, well known artist, who was invited to, to to the museum to to perform to do a performance. But he decided to kind of reflect to analyze the refugee situation, the refugee policy in Poland. Poland, in, in spite of like uh, European Union uh, uh, obligations, uh, has accepted zero refugees, zero. 
so uh, uh, together with Hungary. So there are like two countries which haven't received any, any, any refugees uh, so far. And uh, uh, Pope L decided to produce to produce a TV commercial which will be like inserted, which will be like circulating in the media, not labeled as an artwork. So it would be like this disturbance, this turbulence. Actually, I don't like this kind of turbulence metaphor. Uh, turbulence is something, it's a temporary disturbance. And I think we are facing an apocalypse. So it's turbulence, it's something which I, I'm afraid of flying, so I don't like turbulences, but this is what you can really live with. So uh, uh, Plama, uh, uh, Plama is a title of the of this little. It's like 40 seconds. It's a very short thing to be inserted. A Plama is the spot, like when you leave a trace. It's a, it's a, it, it's a spot. Plama. 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 <laughs> the public TV, which is like uh, quite a propaganda center now, uh, 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 coordinated, like orchestrated by the ruling party, Right and Justice, Prawo i Sprawiedliwość, have, of course, they have rejected, you know, like they decided, okay, we can, we can show it, uh, because now it's like also like the public TV is losing its audience, like massively. People cannot stand this, like the level of, of this sheer stupid propaganda, which can be compared only to the communist period. Uh, so they said, yeah, we can, we can screen it. Uh, you, you can buy a, a TV commercial like uh, um, cheaply. It can be like, like uh, broadcasted cheaply, but they say we can, we can, we can do it, but we will have like a, some like experts in the studio and they will comment on it. So like explaining like our <laughs> kind of policy. <laughs> so like an artwork had to be packed. So talking yesterday about like this conceptual edifice of the, of the, of the, of the uh, conceptual architecture of the of, of a 19th century museum when you have like a label and when you have like uh, the author, uh, they rejected it. They said, no, it's anonymous. We cannot just play it. You know, because people between between other commercials. So uh, uh, last two years, we uh, like we have like as as as, as citizens, as as uh, curators, artists, we have participated in countless countless demonstrations, protests, and uh, the so-called black protest was the first efficient one, and uh, it was the first time when 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 artists uh, took such a such an important part. Uh, uh, kind of giving giving like the, the the visual kind of impact you know like like producing posters uh, 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 stickers uh, banners and really like kind of also like conducting the political imagination that was like a very important uh, 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 um, new kind of role for for the artist very often like like artists who are known for like abstract uh, kind of autonomous works but they decided to kind of like apply apply their competences not in the gallery not making like an art piece but you know participating in the protests uh, 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 making uh, working on kind of like visual kind of uh, aspect of it just a few 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 uh, photos from this uh, from this beautiful uh, beautiful protest uh, uh, which was uh, aimed at uh, protecting, not really protecting, but it's like a way the Right and Justice Party tried to enforce this new abortion law, like a radical abortion law. It would be like the harshest in, 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 in Europe. Uh, but they, they kind of freaked out, you know, like the, the, the mobilization of the, of the people, uh, of, of mainly like uh, female participants was so, so, so big, and, but the, the, the visual impact the 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 uh, black dresses, black umbrellas, uh, black flags. It was like a little bit too much for 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 the ruling party, and this is like we received a, like a lot of like uh, solidarity letters, and it was also like going viral. This is this is uh, quite a 
touching uh, touching uh, example i got this 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 is lucy lipart a very well known uh, art critic curator a legend and she just sent it to me she sent me like i i'm guys i'm with you you know if you if it might help just circulate this 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 image among your like female uh, colleagues and and comrades uh, <laughs> the funny thing it was that uh, uh, talking about time banks, I think uh, Julieta mentioned this this concept of a time bank. Of course, it was a nush, it was a women's strike. You know, like women like rejected to 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 go to work. But uh, what's about like female teachers in primary schools? You know, you had to like replace them. So I was one of the volunteers, and I ended up in a primary school having this completely stupid idea of of uh, uh, having like classes about conceptual art uh, from the 60s and 70s, which was uh, yeah, it, it, it was quite an adventure, I have to say. Uh, uh, the other thing, as we are in Croatia, uh, the other like battlefield is, is, is related to cultural institutions. Visual art, like museums, art museums are not the priority, but uh, uh, the, 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 the Ministry of Culture, the new Ministry of Culture, populist, conservative uh, 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 minister wants to, wants to overtake the theaters. This is like the first thing, just getting rid of the, of the theater directors. And this is, this is, this is a photograph from a from a play called The Cars uh, by a Croatian director, Oliver Frilic, uh, well-known, scandalist, uh, a provocateur, uh, an amazing, I think I'm a big fan. And The Cars, it's, 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 uh, it's, the play is based on, a, on an old text from the 19th century. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a simple story about a little village and a love affair between, between a kind of peasant girl and a priest. And uh, the, the village is being kind of punished by kind of like divine forces. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, 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 it doesn't rain for many years, you know, like there's no, no food and uh, people are suffering. So they are, the, they are uh, stoning the girl to death. They are like punishing the girl. And this is a text from the 19th century. Now it, when it was staged by Oliver Filich, it was more like focused on the pedophilia among uh, priests uh, and uh, it has some like really striking scenes. It's, uh, it's, it's, it begins with a, uh, quite a powerful scene of a fellatio with John Paul II statue. It's, it's really infuriated, like, uh, 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 the, the, the right-wing media. And, uh, and this, is, this is, it turned into, like, a occupation of the theater by some, like, right-wing, uh, 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 like, activists and, like, politicians and members of this ONR, which is, like, the most, like, fascist uh, organization organization in Poland. And uh, I have to say, you know, like being participating in, in all those like struggles, fights, which also like turn out quite uh, violent. Uh, it was quite evident, quite obvious that all, all those guys are like uh, participating in a play. Yeah, it was like all a kind of orchestrated. It, did, it didn't really matter what happened, you know, in the stage. It was more about, you know, like how it resonated on the streets, you know, how it was orchestrated. So, uh, talking about, ab about the involvement of artists, it's uh, uh, also we, as an institution, as a museum, we wanted to kind of support, support the, the, the struggle to create a kind of, uh, yeah, like a sanctuary, a place where you can uh, work, on, work, on, work on banners, when you can have like a, a series of, of seminars, workshops, how to work, for example, with the acoustic layer of the demonstration, which is quite important, how to emit your voice, how to, uh, we have established quite, quite a fruitful collaboration with some, with some like uh, leftist poets, like political poets, and uh, trying to, use the, 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 the potential, the impact of the language uh, of from old poems from the 19th and 20, early 20th century and use them on banners. This is, for example, Uwaga Faszyści Waszczan Artyści is like, beware fascist, your government will be toppled by artists. So it was done by, by students from the Fine Arts Academy, very much involved. And then, you know, like, 
all those like forms of protest started to kind of mushroom up in different places. This is also like an initiative by some like uh, feminist, feminist, anonymous feminist artist uh, protesting against also like the not only the women like like the 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 new regulations of the women's rights, but also the f defosterization of the national parks in Poland. So, just finishing this, like this uh, first part, and I'm just quickly go to the terms, like this artistic thing, artistic competence, artistic kind of excess, like this conceptual surplus was, was used not only by the artists, but it was also like a way of kind of cross-pollinating political activities, political kind of activism. This is an action done by the uh, Razem party, the new leftist party, uh, well, the Together, uh, which I happily joined. And uh, it, this is, this is uh, they used, as we had like this serious uh, also constitutional crisis, Actually, the, 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 the ruling party managed to dismantle the, the constitutional court. Like, uh, so uh, this is the text of the Polish constitution, which is being screened on the, on the, on the government building. And it, it's, it's a quote from Krzysztof Wodiczka, a very well-known artist like, who does you know, public art pieces, uh, uh, quite conscious. So we can see that even like political parties using this, this strategy. Then we move to this uh, new uh, new initiative. It's a, I know it's recorded, but it's secret. You know, like we have established this consortium for post-artistic practices, and it's a, it's a, it's it's a growing kind of uh, structure for uh, artists who want to really use their competences for like political purposes. Now it's like more than 250 people. It's quite a strong network. It's a it's a. Uh, way of uh, it's a platform for organizing like a kind of rapid reaction, uh, rapid reaction uh, demonstrations, performances, and so on. And we learn from each other how to make, for example, during if you I, I am not so like happy about like shouting during demonstrations, you know, like I feel always a little bit embarrassed. But then you can use, for example, such a sim simple and efficient tool, which is like an empty plastic bottle with some little coins. And it's a, it's, 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 it's a, when you have like 10 people using this, this little instrument, it's like, a, it's such a noise, it's, it's, it's hell. So, we are learning how to how to how to work, but we are also like 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 reenacting different different works. You know, like as the reenactment, like a historical reenactment. It's like a genre which is so much financed now by the minist ministries of cultures in different countries in our region. Like it's a hype. You know, like you can have a tank. You can like you know reenact like the execution of like Polish soldiers. You know, like in the 40s. You know, it's 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 really massive. It's really massive. Uh, so we say, okay, yes, we are very much into historical reenactments. We have done it, like uh, we have like discussed it in the early 2000s. Like there was like this uh, kind of. Uh, fixation of like reenacting and and repetition so uh so we decided to establish kind of like living art history classes we started to to repeat pieces in new in a new context this is this is a a brand new one this is rashid arin's piece the arctic circle which is again like a kind of uh, reenactment of uh, richard long's work from 1977 and this is this is this is how it works like on the streets. Uh, there is there is the, this legendary Polish group called Akademia Ruchu, the Academy of Movement, a kind of theatrical performative uh, uh, political collective, very active in the 80s. And and in 1980 they did this piece, which is uh, which is uh, a, a banner a banner with the sentence which is engraved on the facade of the federal co of the <laughs> of the main court uh, uh, building in in Warsaw uh, so they wanted to act as mirrors like human mirrors they uh, they they exhibited like they displayed the sentence which was on a building but the people who work inside the building they couldn't see it yeah it's like the 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 the, the communist time so it's it says yeah, Adam, how would you translate this? Like the justice is the foundation of like uh, strength and uh, endurance of, of the Republic of Poland. 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> so this is, this is uh, a repetition, this consortium for post-artistic practices, repeating it during some demonstration in front of the presidential palaces, palace. And then, you know, you have a piece, which is like you know it from this black and white blurry photos. You do it again and you see people crying. You know, it's like a, such an impact, it's such an emotional impact. You see, yeah, we have tools. Like, we have tools. We have kind of neglected them. And now, like, uh, three terms. The first term is, of course, uh, uh, introduced by, by, by Stephen Wright, or kind of excavated, is the one-to-one -one scale artistic practice. We are not scaling down the... the uh, certain like situations which we see in the streets, which we see somewhere, somewhere else, we are not presenting models or maquettes or, or like yeah, little, little like replicas of pre-existing situations in the gallery, but a one-to-one -one situation is, uh, is, is, is an attempt to, to be there, to like to act and to, uh, you know, like to protect the environment, you know, like to be on a boat, you know, like to be somewhere, to, to, to be employed as a, as, a, as a cleaner or to be, to be really, uh, use, to use the, 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 the strategies, the, the, like the competences, the skills somewhere else. Of course, it was like uh, uh, Stephen Wright took it from, from this uh, Louis Carroll's uh, book about cartographers, you know, there was like this idea of producing like this, uh, Borges did it also later, and um Umberto Eco also like used, used this, this, this figure, but it was this idea of uh, producing like this gigantic map, which is like one-to-one -one scale for the farmers, and they rejected it, it because it would block the sunlight, so they decided to yeah, yeah, so they decided to uh, uh, use the territory as the map. Yeah, so this is more or less like what, what, what we are trying to do very often is like using uh, like this existing, existing situation as, uh, as the material, as the substance, but also like the scenography for uh, certain, certain practices. The other thing, and it's very important, I would like to discuss it maybe with you when it comes to like the, 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 the institution and institution working in this kind of social, like, yeah, turbulent or apocalyptic times. It's the it's the dark matter. The dark matter. It's a, it's a term from uh, from astrophysics, and uh, it it it's it's yeah. You know, nobody has seen it. Yeah, but it must be there. You know, like ninety percent of like the mass of the universe is somehow missing. Uh, Gregory Cholet uh, introduced this metaphor in his book called Dark Matter to describe the dark matter of art system, yeah, like of the art circles. We see the stars, they are kind of, they glow, they, 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 they shine, you know, they are really quite present, but then 90% or 99 and more percent uh, is not visible. All those art students who left the, the, the academy, you know, like they, they are not present. They, don't, they are not present in the collections, they are not exhibited, they are not circulating. So the question here is what are we doing as, as, as museums, as also like very often public institutions, to take care of the art community? Not like collecting certain works. Is there like a way and that's why I uh, love so much working with some Dani Art Foundation, because this is, you know, there's no, like, you know, you have all those, like, artist-run initiatives, collectives, and they are being taken care. And there is no, like, judgment, you know, like, it's not about quality, you know, like, it's, it's of course, it's quality. Yeah, we can discuss it later, but who cares, you know, in our times. Uh, it's just to strengthen them, to create this, like, uh, yeah, this, 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 it, 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 to work as a kind of like a greenhouse, but we can discuss it later. But especially now, in this time, in the times of this conservative counter revolution, our policy of like you know filtering out the good ones, like repeating, you know, like the same names, it's like it might be regarded also like as a part of this kind of elitist culture, which is being criticized by such a party as right and justice in Poland, you know. So we are like this enclave for the privileged. 
what to do with the dark matter of the art world. And the last thing, I would like to finish with a kind of optimistic, uh, <laughs> optimistic proposal. I'm uh, uh, an advocate of a kind of pata institutionalism, and it, it's yeah, it's a it's a joke, but it's a serious joke. Uh, it's of course it's a quote from pata physics. Uh, which was which was proposed by Alfred Jarry, uh, and uh, pataphysics. I would just uh, use this the last sentence is the science of imaginary solutions. That's why I believe in kind of pata institutionalism as so a kind of science of imaginary solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent survey, <laughs> Puja. Yeah. Would you like to take on? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, DBA Twenty One, for having me here. Um, I feel pretty much the interloper, the only kind of Asian being around, <laughs> I think, and of course, gender balance. But um, I'm going to speak very much from the local, really from the local. I run an independent not-for-profit, as we mentioned, which is called Coach, and um, we're now in our 20th year. And I think it's when, we, when I received this invitation, it seemed really opportune moment to talk about, um, you know, to think about questions, what next for Coach? Not only because we're very precarious, you know, given that we work through year funding, we never get public funding, but we actually have ended a certain um, funding cycle, but also because of the situation that's happening in India. I don't know how many of you know what's going on, but really we're, uh, I think for the first time in my life, uh, and I've been around a while, it's, uh, you really sense this sense of fear that is overtaking India and our entire ethos there. Um, as I speak, we really, the, the Rohingyas are being deported, and that's what India says it's going to do. We have had in the last week itself a horrendous murder of a very strong um, a journalist called Gauri Shankar. She was, uh, she spoke locally in the local language in Karnataka. She was shot in complete, uh, you know, she was coming home and she was shot in the back and in the head. And they say it's because she spoke also in the local term. She had a very strong following. She was very anti-BJP, uh, which is our current, and spoke against the Hindu Rashtra or the, you know, the growing nationalism that's happening in India now, where it's being stuffed down your throat pretty much. The current government is not only um, insisting that we are suddenly this Hindu Rashtra of a certain kind, but has started kind of going after a certain community, largely the Muslims, and we've had um, lynching of, of several individuals, really lynching them, taking them off trains, beating them up, because they were suspected of having eaten beef. Yeah, I mean, we, I cannot even believe this kind of madness because we never had that. A large part of South India, eats beef and we're all Hindus, it doesn't matter, I eat beef. But this having to prove that you're suddenly a Hindu and if you're not, then it's anti-national in some way, that you don't subscribe to this right-wing idea is very new to all of us. Um, of course, we've had, started by an artist, a huge campaign which says not in my name and it was taken up by an artist and it really people came out in droves all over India. This was all over India. We said, this is not in our name. You cannot talk about Hindutva and India in this, in this manner. And you cannot target a particular community, including Dalits. I don't know if you all know what Dalits are, but Dalits are the, the lowest community, which is always seen as the untouchables in India. And they've, there's been this very dogged way of doing that. I've just heard, I was just watching I mean, looking at my news, and there's also in West, in Bengal, which is a very open space, where they're insisting a certain kind of Hindutva, you know, there's Durga Puja, which is a big festival, which you showed, and they're saying that we must have a certain um, arms, um, a kind of a puja, a puja being a prayer, which is with arms, and they're insisting it has to happen. It's never been part of Calcutta. It's never been part of the Durga Puja. So they're even kind of insisting that the... Hinduism that exists does not exist, but we want you to tell you this is what Hinduism. I'm sure it sounds very familiar to everybody in different parts of the world, but we are sensing it for the first time. Yeah. Um, so it's within this milieu that, uh, you know, I've come here really with more questions than anything else. We're a small organization, really quite small. 
And for a long time, you know, we do what, uh, I love Camilla's word, uh, a lot of useless stuff, you know, uselessness, where you do what you do. You know, you work with projects, you come up with ideas, you um, do seminars and talks, and, you know, believe in what you do. We've done 10 years of art and ecology because we believed we needed to talk about it. But somehow, I think now we just, at least we are at, at a tiny code in all the arts. What does it really add up to? You know, what are we really doing? What does it mean to be functioning like this and feeling that your hands are tied? It's also to add to this, it's um, the current uh, government has decided civil society must not exist. And therefore, they've kind of knocked what they call um, the FCRA. You know, we have this Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. A lot of not-for-profits work on international funding. And that's there, you know, because the government doesn't support you, so it is international funding. In the last year alone, they have not renewed 20,000 FCRAs. And of course, it's under the garb of security, people are getting money. Guess what? We're getting money because we're also, it's coming in from Christian countries and they're, they're, um, you know, they're getting everybody to become Christians. I mean, it's all kinds of banal stuff. But as some of you must have known, and I think I was talking to somebody yesterday, John, I think, where there was a witch hunt, not only for Greenpeace, because they actually stood up for uh, a witch hunt. They've frozen their accounts. They've completely gone for them. And so for organizations like us, you just say that uh, where we're dependent on international funding, that how do we function? You know, would you cop out? I mean, you can say we must stand for what we do, but if they're going to just knock you out because they can, you know, that's what they have the power, what do you do? So, I mean, this is the background, and these are the questions that I've really been thinking about. But anyway, just to go backwards, this is where we are located. We're in a very small, mixed neighborhood. Um, it's called, it's, um, it's called Khirki, which means um, window, actually. It's, at one end, you have a big, now two temples, not one, but two temples, so very Brahmanical. At the end of the road, you have a huge Muslim population. And in between all of that, you have a huge number of migrants from Afghanistan, from different countries of Africa, Cameroon, Somalian, Nigerian, etc., And of course, local um, migrants who come from different states to earn their living in the big city and then carry on to work and go back. So we, it's within this where we exist, and this is our little space called Khoj. I just want to go back a little bit just to tell you how we began, and the only way I want to say suggest is just share one project with you and some of the fallout of that and the kind of work we've been doing. Uh, in order maybe just intuitively we're sensing is this somewhere we should be going or not? I don't know, so I want to put this to you. So this was just going back to 2014. Um, in, at night, 12 o'clock, the then law minister of the Delhi government, as well as the uh, MP of that area, came in and uh, insisted that the police arrest two Ugandan women, right there. It was down the lane from us, and said that you've got to arrest them because they're, uh, if they're indulging in flesh trade and drugs, and you've got to do this. And it was a huge furor. It hit all the national headlines. I know that this was a time when a lot of them were persecuted, and the women, I mean, they were stuck there for, I think, six hours. They had to pee on the street. It was like offensive at the worst. And this was the minister doing this. What were we heading for? Um, we decided at that point as an arts organization, which is located in this, that how do we actually deal with this? There was going to be no knee-jerk reaction. We weren't going to get up and you know, start. We couldn't do that. What we did do is um, there was a friend of ours, an archae um, who's at now at Goldsmiths, in fact, Gabriel Etiraj, who'd been working on hip-hop culture, and he'd worked with two young youth and produced this film, two young African youth who were based there, on what it means to be African in that, in that locality. And we were horrified. I mean, you know, really, we think we know it all, we understand what's going on, but the kind of racism that exists, and Indians are really racist. Maybe it's got something to do with the caste system, but it's racist where they're called terrible names, like um, you're a, uh, we call them a hubshi, which means you're cannibal eaters, you eat your babies. I mean, it was just, and they say it to you, they insult you, on the streets. And that's what they, a lot of the Africans were facing. And we saw this film and we screened it three months later. And they said, you know, what do we do about this? And so uh, for, a, for a week we did a research residency. We invited um, Intone from Chimurenga to come and 
work with us. We got in a lot of people who were working with Africa studies, artists, etc., and really tried to understand the history of Africa and India, which has existed since 13th century, you know, when the Abyssinian slaves rose to be kings, during the non-aligned movement, which was very, very strong, and then nothing, 80s and 90s, nothing. And then 2000, suddenly, there's all these Africans pouring into different parts of India, Hyderabad being one of them, Bangalore and Delhi. Why? There's also this whole sexualized idea of the over-sexualized male black, which has been perpetuated in, um, in culture, in all our popular culture, in Bollywood films. You always see a male black strong man behind <laughs> these things with a cabaret happening in front of it. No, it's actually been, pop it's been pushed there. So there is this whole sense that we were, you know, that we did through a research and said, okay, can we then build a project around that? And we worked with, um, we set out a residency because that's the model that we use so that we can come back to it every year. And we uh, invited, put out a call and invited artists across the world who wanted to talk about this. And we went into it for three years, this is our third year, expanding it also to the, um, to the Indian Ocean Studies because, you know, given what's happening in Af with China, with the one belt, one a road and what's going on where India has suddenly decided not to be part of it. We said, let's see what's going on. Let what are artists really thinking across this whole belt. So this is the project that's going on. But one of the one of the few things that fell out of it uh, through the cracks. I mean, these were some of the projects. One of them being Andrew Fugel, whose great grandmother was, um, you know, uh, was in trench labor and was sent off from Calcutta without her family and just put on a ship to Cameroon and had to kind of figure it out over there. So he's come back tracing that. Anyway, one of the few things that some of the local artists did was to begin a few um, projects. And I'll just mention two, three of them, not in detail, though they're very beautiful, lovely projects, but one of them being Khirki Avaz, which was a quarterly, um, quarterly newspaper. It was started by an artist. And she spent a lot of time, because she's lived in Khirki, interviewing people, talking to them, making it very, you know, very, very informally, building um, this relationship. And actually, we produce about 3,000 in Hindi and in English, and circulate them, and talk to people. And now, a year on, there is the sense that, um, you know, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the younger African people are beginning to write for it, which is really quite something. The second project in, uh, is, um, well, the one that I want to do, is really looking at very low technology. Uh, so we set up a little shop where you can recharge phones. You know, mobile phones are something that every person, every young kid on the street has, because that's, we've kind of gone through that. Um, and they come in and recharge their phones for 10 rupees and 20 rupees, and you know, something very small because they just need to be, but they've all wanted. So we set that up, and this artist, decided that she would actually put music which belonged to the Caribbean music and Congolese music and Bhojpuri music, which is very vernacular music and Hindi music, and put that onto their uh, rechargeable sims. And as a result, really circulate that music, which has become really exciting. I mean, suddenly you've got people listening to the beat of African music. And uh, this little they shop, huh? they, they did not know. So when they're listening to this, what are they listening to? <laughs> um, but what's really interesting is that little shop, and it's really like six feet by six feet. It's, it's at the shop window, which she mans three times a week, and a woman in that very male-dominated place. A lot of them started coming there, chatting. It became a kind of place for discussion, where uh, on the 15th of August, when we were talking about independence, we had the Ivory Coast, one uh, Ivorian African saying, oh, but 14th was our independence, and when this happened. And, Conversations which would never have happened between very disparate, you know, Indians who thought that you can't touch blacks, literally, you know, you cannot, they're untouchable. Um, and there's this conversation that has begun to happen. But also, we've, it's become a little studio. And a lot of the Africans have come there and started rapping. I mean, I've got a few videos which have, with other younger people, they've begun to, um, to work on that. Yeah. And finally, there was, um, we did over a year and a half a small project with a PhD student who was looking at refugees with UNHR, UNHCR, an artist and a, uh, and a, um, a graphic designer. A very nice little, uh, we had storytellings with three, um, one Somalian refugee and two others 
who came in regularly to Khoj, and we had, we've come up with this graphic novel over a year and a half, which was done really pro bono, pretty much. We just had money to print this. That was it. And now that's also being shown in our film. I mean, I talk about these projects not because they're great projects. They are. I mean, they're very beautiful. They can be unpacked in many levels. They can really be really thought through. But because they've really created spaces of conversation, safe spaces. And over the past few months, we've had you know, young Afghan girls walking in because they're not allowed to go anywhere except to Koj and home where they do all kinds of, they want to learn Bollywood dancing. So after hours, they can do that. So it's become like a community space in many ways. You have a hip hop happening with a lot of kids. This is after 6.30 to 7.30 strictly after we finished our work. But it has created a safe space and we've got a lot of people coming in to talk. Last Saturday, we had all the NGOs working with refugees, including the UNHCR, asking if they could actually use our space to have a meeting. But for me, that seems to be a space that maybe we should be growing. You know, these safe spaces which we need. And more so today, where we need to stay under the radar, where we need to figure out what are we really doing? You know, and is this a way to go? I don't know. So I have lots of questions. Because at some point, you also feel defeated. I mean, as somebody who's the, who runs the organization, uh, as an individual, I'd like to say, yeah, let's say what we have to. But can I throw the baby out with the bathwater? Because then we'd suddenly have killed it if we have no funding, et cetera, or we are in the radar of the, this horrendous government. And we're certainly not going to take money from the state, even if we can, because we're more than three years old, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we're really kind of figuring out what is it that we should be doing. And you do feel helpless, because these are small projects. They do help unpack. But does scale matter? I mean, can we? it's nice to talk about uselessness, but can we also be a little useful? I don't know. Is it possible? Can we push something somewhere? I don't know. So they're just questions that I come with. And I'm, I'd be really interested to know what people who work at a very local scale have to say about that. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I think so far we had uh, two excellent surveys on two local situations. Now we're going to shift a little bit. And uh, Thomas has the word. Yeah. And um, it's not easy to shift a little bit, as you say, and to ask you, and ask myself also, to um, move to Paris, where I, where I work. And it's not easy, and it's um, it's uneasy, and um, and it should be after what um, Suchat has just um, described. Um, but I may, I'm going to um, maybe pick up on um, your conclusion and um, the question. You said, what is it that we are doing? And, um, and I want to talk to uh, talk about my situation in Paris and about the situation in Paris and try to uh, yeah, think through this word of turbulence in Paris to go back to the year 2015. In, um, because um, so on a, on, a, on a work like personal level, uh, this is the year where we decided to uh, stop doing one of these uh, small scale uh, project that I say we because it was like a collective running it and something that started in 2007. And at the time in 2007, um, so we had the freedom to start. And, uh, and we wanted to make a statement about this freedom to start something, to establish something. And uh, for seven, eight years, uh, we, we, we had the freedom to continue. It was like a self-funded, uh, self-willed, self-organized, uh, strict, very independent project. And so we wanted to make a, we, yeah, we made a statement for uh, many years, I mean, seven to eight years, that this kind of project could continue as it was intended to. And, um, but in 2015, uh, we wanted to make a statement also about the fact that we, we have the freedom to stop it. And uh, that continuity is, um, is something that also is, um, um, how do you say? <sighs> that is e e it's easier to continue than, uh, than to stop. So there were many reasons for 
why we stopped and um, internal reasons also economic reasons you know so internal reasons let's say but there was also one you know major I think but maybe it made sense retrospectively and so it was not part of the reasons why we stopped but thinking about it now I can understand it uh, much better so 2015 in Paris is also the year where some kind of continuity uh, breaks down and uh, and by continuity I'm not I'm not um, speaking about some kind of uh, easy joyful uh, peaceful life on on the opposite I think uh, until 2015 people living in Paris um, got used to so many political defeats to being so di dispersed to um, to we were in a very, very bad state, shape, let's say, out of shape completely. And, uh, but continuity makes, makes it, you know, makes you not reflect so much about this. And so what happened in like the first days of January 2015 uh, with the, uh, the killings of um, the, most of the team from Charlie Hebdo and then one day after uh, the killings in the Hypercacher in, in Vincennes, uh, came to break, break this continuity. Again, not as a kind of like, um, it wasn't about like sideration and something that we, don't, we didn't know how to make sense. We knew it was there, but it was just like under the carpet for so many, so many years, and continuity was this thing that you know, uh, was you know, making us not think about this. And of course, the whole year of 2015 has been about uh, this, let's say, until uh, November uh, and the attacks, uh, I mean, the coordinated attacks of, the, of November 2015. And, um, so, and we stopped the space, we, uh, but not because of this, really, and, uh, in December 2015. And not because of this is part I think today is a very good reason uh, why to stop such a project like this. Um, it's uh, because we were not addressing any of these. You know. We were addressing art world. Um, I mean, I'm still very proud somehow of uh, everything that we've been doing uh, for these eight years. But um, it would have been impossible, let's say, to you know, continue, continue like this and not address anything, especially because the year of 2015 involves so much uh, thinking also and this double, you know, double bind desire of trying to understand uh, what you don't understand and, of course, trying to, uh, let's say, not, underst not understand what you, you, know, you think you understand too well. You know. And so, a very complex uh, situation, uh, lots of conversation, and in the end, when you think about it, and I mean, this is, this is gonna sound, you know, probably uh, uh, a little stupid or banal, you know, coming from, you know, but so let's keep in mind that I'm coming, I'm talking from this, like, situation of being in Paris, but I think that what most of us, um, I mean, certainly in my case, I've, um, you know, the, I've managed to um, learn from grappling with the sprawling prolixities of all this conversation and uh, thinking about what was the state of uh, France in 2015 can be summed up to something that is very uh, succinct and chilly, which is that whoever is in your life now, whoever you cross in the street, or whoever you find shoulder to shoulder into an exhibition space, can get killed. And this changed somehow everything for us living in Paris. And it's not, I mean, of course it's unlikely that it's going to happen. That's just like an hypothesis. But just the possibility of it, ask requires us to include this in, I think, uh, the work we do. I think you cannot, I mean, in 2015 in Paris, you could no longer 
if you were like a filmmaker, uh, decide to uh, film people talking in the streets or uh, having some cigarettes and coffees at a, at a cafe terrace, um, like we see in so many of these uh, French films, um, without including in the image the fact that this protagonist could be killed you know, as a possibility. And, uh, and the same when you describe characters. And of course, the question is, and what do you do of this? I mean, it's probably easier uh, when you're a filmmaker to include this uh, than when you're an artist or you're a curator or anything like this. So I think it requires a lot of you know, time and thinking uh, for all, many of us in Paris to, um, yeah, to come to terms with this. And I think nobody has you know, come to terms with this uh, so far. Um, so the, the other point I was, uh, so I was, I wanted to give an example, a much more recent example um, of the, um, something that is like being uh, a very recent exhibition, in fact. Uh, and it's interesting because it happened at the Pompidou. Um, so it's this exhibition that just opened like a few, uh, few weeks ago. I have nothing to do with this. So I'm just like speaking as a, as a viewer because I think we've become more of a viewers than actors uh, in the recent, uh, in the last couple of years, let's say. And it's a, it's a project, I don't know if you've heard about it, but this, this is what I wanted to um, mainly talk about it. To, I mean, talk about uh, today is this project by Eric uh, Baudelaire and Marcella Lista, which is called Après. So, uh, to my knowledge, it's the, it's the first project that really addressed uh, the year 2015. Am I already too long? No, it's okay. Um, I'm going to be like, very uh, uh, short about this. Unfortunately, it's a project that probably you won't be able to see if you haven't seen it already, because the Pompidou only gave it like two weeks. Uh, and, of course, this brings a lot of questions about also the fear that an institution uh, like the Pompidou can have with a project like this. And, uh, but just to say like, uh, just a few things about this, um, about this project, which is called Après, After, and which is the two of them, Eric Baudelaire, the artist, and Marcella Lista, the curator, uh, trying to um, do a project about this. So it's, it's, it's based around a film that Eric Baudelaire, who is um, an artist and a filmmaker who comes with a um, background in political science did, and which retraces the, um, the, tra the biographical trajectory of, um, of a jihadist. It's, the, the film is called, like, um, also known as Jihadi. It's a film from 2017. And yeah, this is something that they, that they published on the occasion of the exhibition that they give to the audience. And um, so there's this film, it's in the gallery three of the, of the Pompidou, so the one that is usually about like the, I mean the ones where Pierre Huy or Philippe Arenaud, which is a place of consecration uh, for artists, it's like the show, the monographic exhibition of the, of the, of the Pompidou. And um, in this case, what I find really interesting uh, and really important is that it's very aware, it's an exhibition that is very aware of what it can't be. It can't be an exhibition by Eric Baudelaire. It can't be an exhibition about an artist. It can't be an exhibition that even foregrounds like an artistic practice and yeah, bring it to the foreground. And uh, it can't ev even be like a curatorial project about this, about uh, what happened uh, in 2015. And there's a very nice way, I mean, Sandra, you probably you used to that show, so um, maybe you can add things to, uh, to this. Um, is that, yeah, they did it like together. Basically, they did it together. So there's the, of course, there's the film by Eric, but then they made a selection of works from the Pompidou collection um, that are organized around like a, a lexicon. Again, it's not a, it's not a genius idea. You know, it, it, bring, it brings back the idea of the ABC there, but this is not what it's about. This is not what, it's, it's not a show that wants to make a show about an artist where to, uh, you know, there's no idea of like distinction in, the, in this show and this is very um, um, a welcoming feeling, welcome feeling. Um, and then they have like conversations organized every night for a week. Um, 
And again, the way they've been doing this, there's no, you know, usually when you have a curator and an artist, you know, the curator makes a lot of uh, sentences to thank the artist for his, in his or her invaluable contribution to the institution, to the, or just to thinking or to, you know, culture, let's say. And um, in this case, this is not what it's about. You know, they really conduct the conversation together. There's no role differentiation or anything like this. It's also, so it's very aware of what it can't be. An exhibition like this can't be. It's very aware also of um, what it can't do. And uh, what it can't do is make big claims. What it can't do is um, even have the hope to change or modify a situation substantially. And it's very clear about this. And I don't know how to explain this, but it's really the feeling that you have when you participate in this conversation or when you see the show and the selection of works they have made from the institution also, making sure that for once, it's not about the Pompidou. Usually when they present a collection, <laughs> it's always the institution that shows itself and how great it is and how beautiful the collection. And more and more, all these institutions have been just showing themselves all the time. And they made a very precise you know, selection with many works actually from the library, the Kandinsky Library, so prints and films. And uh, so there's, there's a really interesting institutional also, um, I don't want to say critique because again, it brings it into a canon of like artistic practice and I really don't think that it's what, it, that it, what it's about. Um, but which gave a dimension that for once, since 2015, I really have um, the impression, I mean, the feeling and leaving that space and leaving the conversations uh, at night one day, that we, yeah, what was the, the, the question again? That, you know, these people knew what they were doing <laughs> and it felt so good. Yeah. good. Thank you. Nabil. I was just uh, um, sort of thinking from what, what I've heard from everyone, right, that um, in each case there's, we're talking about really extreme kinds of violence, right, like, you know, right-wing nationalism, violence against women, immigrants, um, Hindu nationalism, this collapse of war and peace, you know, in, in a city, right. Um, um, and each case, uh, uh, and it was great because I missed our little earlier breaks. I have absolutely no idea what you were going to say. So you were right before. So it, it, so it was really nice that, that you actually um, somehow, you know, took another turn, right? To say that, well, actually, you know, it, it, you know for, the, for the organization, that the collective that you're doing, the, the, the thing to do was to stop, right? You know, doing what, what was happening, right? Uh, given, given this precipitous sort of moment. Um, so, so in a, in a way, which is also a kind of a acknowledging of of the of of the, of the violence, right? So um, I suppose I want to begin really by um, trying to focus on on this act of naming uh, violence, right, as 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 one step towards um, you know dealing with it, uh, and this uh, um, uh, and then to and then to perhaps not uh, add in addition. Uh, let's say, you know, ecology or the, in, in the environmental, but rather to think about it in ecological terms, i.e. that it's not just additional, but it's somehow cumulative or, or subtractive even, perhaps. So it's not, uh, so it's concatenates and br brings it together, which I think is precisely the, the, uh, the, the turn turbulence that, that, that you mentioned sort of begins its, its life as a, as a term that is, uh, addresses, it comes from, uh, you know, meteorology, um, but then is sort of radicalized uh, in, in terms of social and political unrest and conflict. And yet we are at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at again, um, a kind of a long duration, durational sort of time where um, the, 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 the that meteorological moment, right, which might be only a small segment of, of weather patterns, you know, expands to the to the to the climate. Um, 
So, so the the. So I want to sort of begin, uh, I suppose, really by um, speaking, speaking about two omissions, right, that, that took place uh, in what, what uh, um, in, in human terms, was the, um, the, the, the most, the biggest, or most ambitious attempt to produce a mega institution, the United Nations. And, uh, and, and specifically within that, uh, um, as a response to, to, the, to the Second World War, uh, and 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 the and the and the um, Holocaust. Um, also, as also as sort of like a, a I suppose a kind of uh, a last moment effort, right, to 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 protect the Westphalian you know state system organization uh, under which we, whose aegis uh, is is produces you know the the very construction of international law, which uh, our lawyer friends are are debating. Um, Again, a kind of last moment effort to, to, you know, maybe this will be their last conference because international law, as we know it, will uh, vanish. Um, so so uh, what the, the two words that vanished, right, the two terms, uh, these two acts of omission, which are themselves extremely violent, right, is the first um, is um, uh, the Arthur Lemkin is, is the Polish jurist uh, who is, who's coined the term genocide uh, in, in response to, to the Holocaust. Uh, and the term was uh, in response to that urgency uh, of, of what happened uh, uh, was, was codified into international law as a genocide convention. Now Lemkin's definition uh, um, included not only physical destruction of people, right, which is, which is again has been the kind of knee-jerk reaction that, that you know, the, the acceptance that genocide only means physical destruction since then. Uh, but, but crucially, Lemkin also included the cultural destruction, uh, which is also comparable, uh, I suppose, if you, you know, to, to the way that uh, um, Achille Mbembe has articulated sort of necropolitics, right? That, i.e., it's not a kind of, uh, it's not a kind of a um, physical death, but a social death, right? Um, and it is this omission uh, um, that then um, somehow is 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 a is a, is a, is, a, is, a, is is a driver, right? To 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 say that you know a whole kind of body of international law and and the way to deal with uh, um, genocide and cr international criminal law has been has been focused on on this aspect and not the other, right? Um, so. So, so in, in a way, it's, uh, I, I'm just also kind of connecting what Armin said the first day about, let's say, indigenous communities, them being also institutions. We can also add to this the idea of, uh, let's say, Philip uh, Pierre Clastre around the society against the state to say that the state is not only the only uh, formation, right, that a group of people can sort of co-produce, right? It can also be a, 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 a negation of the state or an attempt to stay away from that kind of, you know, body politic, right? Um, so uh, it's, so, and, and, and perhaps also uh, um, um, uh, uh, this notion that then, uh, that, that institution is also a culture, right? Uh, and, um, and, and that in a way, um, um, we are very much involved in, 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 that, in that work. Uh, in in, ver in various ways, from from strategies to, to docu documentation and, and you know many others, right? Um, so the next omission is is uh, um, is is one that happens after the uh, um, the Vietnam War, uh, which is um, the omission of the term ecocide from international law. Uh, it is a shift, right, to move from the genos to the eco, which is uh, uh, this notion that if, um, I suppose, in a kind of equation terms, right, if, if the, uh, um, the uh, uh, you know, the organism is, is, is also, you know, the, the, the environment and the species or the organism, then, then the destruction of that environment is, is, a, is, is a destruction of, of that life, right, of that, of that sort of system. Um, and ecocide um, came about, briefly put, as, as a direct response to the use of Agent Orange uh, and the other defoliants in the, in the Vietnam War. 
uh, where scientists uh, actually put, put, the, put the concept forward, um, which was then taken up by the first UN conference on the environment in Stockholm. Uh, and, and, and interestingly, the term was, um, and we can again make a parallel with, with the International Lawyers Association, right? The kind of time scales that they're looking at in, in, this, in, in, in sort of trying to uh, adopt laws and so forth. Um, that the, uh, so international lawyers uh, and, and you know, political participants uh, at the UN from different countries sort of debated the term ecocide uh, at the UN for, for at least 10 years, right? And all of that work uh, came to, the, to, the, to head in um, completely dilution of the term and its, and its uh, entrance into the, uh, um, into the Rome Statute, uh, which includes uh, the, the four crimes against peace, right? Um, uh, and, and genocide being, you know, the, the worst crime sort of humanity has kind of invented. Um, so, but what's interesting is that the omission uh, um, was less about removing the term entirely, right? But using it in a way where um, an ecocide that is in peacetime was excluded, right? And I think this is what sort of conflates this idea or, or shifts, no, this notion that uh, this, you know, that um, that that war, right? I.e., uh, a, a kind of you know, a, a turbulence of, of, you know, a politics that's, you know, turned into a conflict where literally, you know, you know agents are, are sort of in, in fighting, um, sort of shifts that notion, right, that like in peacetime, uh, um, there's, there's just as much sort of violence that can sort of, uh, you know, take place, right, i.e. through the environment, um, but also through, through the everyday and, and, and the, the kind of experiences that we have. And there's been a, a concerted effort uh, now to, which could perhaps be, you know, a generational task uh, for another group of people, right? Uh, and this time, uh, um, well, I don't know who all were involved in that. I mean, the UN Conference on the Environment was brought together all kinds of civil actors as well as political leaders and, and, and so on, right? Um, but that, uh, um, that we, could, we could have a stake, right, a kind of agency to, to, um, to sort of reinstitute the term as a fifth crime against peace, which, for example, has been pushed forward by the, by the international lawyer, Paul Higgins, um, and, and many others. Um, D. Kine, who's, a, who's, who's part of a TBA 21, uh, is, is, has been also working on this topic for, for many, many years. Um, so, uh, so that's sort of, a, a, I suppose, a kind of my uh, articulation, right? Uh, or or maybe, maybe opening up the term to also open up to this notion of the social death, uh, but also turbulence as both an ecological and also a kind of political social um, sort of, a, you know, a materiality, right? Uh, it, uh, perhaps in a way, uh, um, you know, then to sort of, uh, okay, so, so culture and, and uh, uh, yeah, well, language, i.e., right? So, you know, very material, uh, as we know. Uh, um, I, I'm kind of thinking, of, of, let's say, in the, in the sense of uh, the Manuel de Landa's A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History, right, where he's sort of looking at long process of urbanization in Europe, but from the perspective of, um, you know, kind of looking at how language and city, city building and, and these seemingly different kind of stru strata uh, are, are really, you know, can be looked at in certain kind of in geological terms, right? Uh, and, and Delanda reminds us that this is rather less a history book, but a philosophy book written, you know, using the kind of historical sort of long uh, durée as, as a kind of a structure, right? So, um, so, but where is the, uh, uh, the, the land and the water, the, the, the fishes and the sea and, and so on in, in culture? Um, so for this, we must make a shift to uh, very specific places. And, it, and it's no longer uh, a matter of kind of abstraction, right, uh, and, and so on, or, or general, to speak in general terms, and in, in, let's say in, in a, um, as I have so far. But rather, uh, uh, we have to go to the sites. We have to go to very local struggles, right, uh, uh, and at, at different scales. Um, and 
And let's say one articulation of this uh, in the context of the, of the, the Pacific region and, and many other places uh, might be that for, certainly for, for, well, we could say it for indigenous people, but for, for you know, any, anyone, right, really, uh, at one level. It's not, to, it's not to conflate everyone to be indigenous at the same time. Um, is, 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 is this notion that um, uh, another kind of uh, equation here, right, uh, of um, a landscape, uh, a, a water territory, right, is, um, is culture, right? Like, because it is where, you know, <coughs> you know the, where, we, where we sort of live from and on and with. Uh, and the destruction of, cult, of the landscape or, or of the water, of the, of the, of the ecology, right? is then a destruction of culture. Uh, an illustration, perhaps, uh, in the, uh, um, because this is part of a, a longer sort of narrative where I'm, I'm, I'm sort of studying a set of legal, uh, um, sort of very radical legal sort of uh, uh, cases in the, in the Pacific region uh, around um, ecological issues. Um, the, the case is uh, Marshall Islands, uh, in uh, uh, the National Nuclear Commission of the Marshall Islands, which was organized um, uh, in response to the U.S. Uh, nuclear weapons tests in the, in the Bikini Atoll, in the Rongelop, and, and several others. Um, and the Nuclear Commission, the, the tribunal, had uh, two sort of mandates, right? The first is a kind of compensation, uh, which takes the, which is rather known as the downwinders uh, um, sort of, uh, act, uh, which refers to the, how the, the victims are of, in, in Nevada who were living downwind from the nuclear tests were, were, were sort of uh, offered compensation for, for uh, 21 uh, different types of cancers and, or physical illnesses. So this, so this had to be then, this, was, this model was then somehow also sort of adapted to the Marshall Islands case, right? Marshall Islands, in fact, had, a, had, a, had an advantage in, in this David and Goliath kind of situation because they were, they were not fighting an anti-colonial independence struggle like many other places in the Pacific. Um, but rather, they were, um, uh, th there, was, there was this uh, relationship of a, of, a, of a protectorate kind of thing. So they were already somehow included in, in US sort of jurisdiction, which allowed them to maybe even be more uh, um, uh, sort of active, right? So um, the, the second kind of claims uh, was around land rights. And uh, um, there's a, a fascinating, uh, a very important art, sort of article written by the anthropologist uh, Stuart Kirsch, who was uh, 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 sort of working in the Marshall Islands uh, at, during this, well, this long period of the, of the tribunal that, that you know, it, it took place. Uh, by the way, the tribunal, the, the, the money ended, uh, for, I mean, I, I don't want to go into all the details of it, but ba bottom line, uh, they, they didn't ever got the compensation that they that deserved. First of all, not in terms of you know economic reparation, and certainly not in terms of uh, the land, the atolls, and uh, and so and so those very atolls, right, which were um, and um, were uh, evacuated, right, uh, and and people were forced to migrate uh, by the U.S. Uh, that were that were full of radiation, i.e., bikini is still uh, uninhabitable, right. Uh, some of the same communities are facing now, the, the, because of the sea level rise, uh, again, a, a new kind of uh, um, trajectory of, of, this, of this very existential uh, violence, right? Um, but back to the, back to the case, uh, um, a courtroom sort of scenario, uh, um, anthropologists are brought to, you know, uh, to, to, to give expert statements. Um, and the argument is whether the Marshallese, uh, whether the destruction of the atolls counts as a cultural destruction, uh, i.e. counts as a, a land uh, destruction. Um, and one must take an ecological sort of perspective in order to unpack this, right? Because there really is no other way. Uh, you cannot then just, you cannot just say like X comma Y comma Z, but it's rather an additional or, or cumulative uh, body without organ kind of, kind of you know, idea, no? That is to say, um, if, the, uh, uh, if a certain species of tree uh, that was growing in, in, the, in, in this atoll 
uh, in the Marshall Islands, a very long one, a very sturdy one that produced very sturdy wood, which they could then use to produce uh, a very specific type of canoe. The Marshallese are, are, are master navigators. Um, um, I, I only refer you to the, to the cover of the main image of the Tide Electics uh, exhibition. Um, uh, the, uh, um, um, so, so the idea is that if, if, uh, if that species of tree is, is no longer there, then uh, they cannot teach um, how to make those, those canoes anymore, right? Um, and this was a kind of a, um, a kind of an argument, right? That 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 if you think about it, just makes really a, just perfect sense, right? Um, however, uh, um, the judge or, or who was dealing with this la this land rights claims completely disregarded the, this this kind of argument and turned into um, what we currently understand in international law for land to mean, which is property. Uh, so that's, that's, it didn't go far with those kind of arguments. So um, the last uh, 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 sort of point, which I think is also uh, um, perhaps uh, in, in some way, um, um, I don't know, I mean, collectives, institutions, organizations, I mean, we're, we're all sort of uh, kind of focusing on our, our, our energy in, you know, we could have easily done this and, you know, taken something in a completely different way. But it's 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 great to sort of have have this thing where you kind of you saying the word institution like a mantra, right, for the for the last couple of days and and see sort of you know what what that what that produces. Um, so um, so and so the the final point is uh, is is actually a um, a life project uh, which which sort of addresses uh, in in. In its highest aspiration, uh, a, a kind of generational struggle to, let's say, have the recognition of ecocide, and therefore the recognition of the of those of those violences, right, uh, and and against those forgettings, against those omissions, and and, and against those, uh, you know, this is something that's simultaneously psychic uh, as well, I suppose. So. Um, which is sort of like a, a very slow kind of articulation uh, of, of a research that I started uh, about four years ago um, uh, on, uh, on, on sort of gathering evidence and documenting um, the ecocide, the unfolding ecocide uh, in, in West Papua, which is the western half of the, the Pacific island of New Guinea, uh, which is, is uh, in a recent book from Jason McLeod, who's, who's, a, who's, a, who's worked there for many, many years, uh, referred to as the Palestine of the Pacific, right? Um, where there's for, for about 40 years an uh, Indonesian military occupation, which can be articulated also in, in its mineral wealth that's found in, in, in the gold and the copper mines, but also in the, in the timber, the palm oil plant, you know, sort of the it is the palm oil frontier, as well as a, as a kind of mineral frontier, right? So, um, and, and those violence, which the Indonesian military used in the, in, uh, um, in the 70s, which was um, firebombing villages and, and uh, military strikes, have turned into tactics where political prisoners are, you know, uh, the number of political prisoners, even in Jokowi's presidential term, has only increased you know, huge amounts of HIV, uh, I mean, all sorts of sort of, uh, um, sort of all kinds of, you know, turbulence, right? I, I suppose I'm also not so comfortable with that word, but. Um, but, uh, so, so the, the project is really a, a sort of began with this, with this process, but, but with um, a kind of a, a, um, um, a problem, right? Which is that the forum, a legal forum, i.e. given that there is no ecocide uh, in, in, recognized in international law, um, uh, how does one sort of uh, um, work simultaneously in presenting, in the making of new forums, um, but also in, in sort of supporting a kind of a, a, a legal social movement, right, um, um, to, to reinstitute the term into international uh, law? Uh, and towards this, uh, i.e., you know, the West Papua case is sort of a beginning, then started a kind of a new journey, right, which um, 
uh, for me was a was a was a really a completely new way to see the the whole you know situation. But I think it was felt by a lot of people working in, in also in the West Papua conflict. Is that is that to shift this identity of West Papua from um, being part of Indonesia to sort of rethinking it again as part of the Pacific Island family uh, in, in, micro, in, in Melanesia, for instance. As you know, in the Pacific, it's Micronesia, Polynesia, and Melanesia forms Oceania, right, of, of, the, of, the, of the peoples and the states uh, and the polities. Um, uh, and that journey uh, is, 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 is sort of... Uh, um, Sort of producing or, or putting together a, a kind of a, um, a, a very uh, uh, somehow an agile and, and multi sort of connected sort of a, um, organization, um, um, which is growing as TBA 21 Academy is growing. Uh, in, in a way, we're sort of facing the same uh, um, questions and, and struggles. Um, so, so in, in, in a way, it, it makes beautiful sense that it's it's also like a, a commission with with uh, with the academy, uh, along with uh, um, other uh, many other people. We're beginning to uh, somehow articulate how to how to take this to to Bangladesh, which is where I'm from, uh, Ariel, and so on. I, I think that your contribution is uh, strong enough to leave it here for the moment being, because I think that um, I mean the different uh, renderings of these uh, turbulence have already opened uh, enough of uh, different uh, smaller conflicts and concepts, and it would be good to, at this point, try to wrap up a little bit. And I really appreciate you actually uh, enacted this kind of turn, if they wish uh, to term turbulence, it's something that has to be reconciled with its climate, uh, environmental, sort of uh, uh, regional uh, identity. But I would like to insist on something that has been uh, recurrently appearing here. Puja said when describing one of these particular uh, turmoils in India that the government has declared that civil society must disappear. You know, I mean, it's like, where's, uh, I mean, the kind of um, violence uh, that you are describing, it could also be extrapolated, and this was the original conversation we had yesterday when planning this, uh, uh, how the panel could go, uh, and it all comes because I happen to be working with a photographer like Susan Micellas who in 1991 was among the team that uh, arrived first uh, at the sites of the mass graves uh, after the Amphal campaign. So she went there as a magnum photographer to actually uh, get evidence, photographic evidence, but she went there with forensics and with human rights experts. And what a photographer, uh, like her experience in front of all those uh, corpses, uh, it was that instead of photographing those corpses, those dead bodies. She understood that what it was massacred there, it was a constituted civil society. And then how can you photograph the massacre of a constituted civil society? It's no longer a matter of quantities. How many? Hundred? A thousand? Eh? So the turn she had to go through, Susan Micellas in 1991, even being, even though she was a magnet photographer, someone trained to capture these uh, moments through photographs as dramatic as possible, it was not to take any photograph. Instead, she undertook the reconstruction of the visual history of the Kurdish people. Hmm. So I'm trying also to point at the fact that, uh, I mean, it is important to actually make a, an inventory, cataloging, and get trained in new forms of description about all these violence that in some way, I mean, make me recall like this cognitive map Frederick Jameson was first starting to talk about in the late 70s, you know. It's, he was basically inspired by the idea that all of a sudden we can be aware of many events taking all over the planet. We can be super well informed, but then how can we really act? How can we really respond? And most of all, we lack the empirical experience of those events. 
from which we have been, uh, we got uh, an important report. But I really, I, I'll, I'll give you the, the mic immediately after, but I think that, I mean, um, we must also recall that the notion that the civil society, the, 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 civil, the institution is a derivative of the civil society. If we think of many of the museums, at least the ones we have in Europe, they are uh, instituted actually as uh, governmental uh, representations of uh, the civil society. So the civil society gets to be represented there. And then the institution is like the kind of the overall result of a civil society desiring or wishing to have an institution, a public museum. But at this point, I would like to recall an important article by Michael Hart. He wrote it in 1995. The title was The Withering of the Civil Society. So we are in the wake of the emergence of the multitude. And the multitude as a response to the civil society. The civil society, according to Michael Hart, uh, it's based on a representation that um, it's, 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 it's legitimate as much as you have a capital to invest within that museum, that institution. As long as you have an, an identifiable form of capital, you can be part of that civil society, you can take part in the government of that institution. If your capital is not identified, name, i.e., namely finance capital, then you cannot be represented as part of the civil society. That's why the term multitude came as a very useful sort of, uh, you know, step for work. Because the term multitude, uh, and I really would like, even though the multitude cannot be reduced to single a statement or image, and is often better represented by the noise. Sebastian was beautifully uh, kind of uh, stressing all the noise sound strategies in, in those demonstrations, you know? But I really would like to think that, I mean, when the Pompidou is opening the doors, what it was waiting at, at, at the entrance, it was a multitude, you know, also. So all this excursion uh, to say that, um, I mean, the turbulences we are confronted with uh, a really kind of a, it's a really problematic term in as much as we have to get as local as possible and we have to recall also the genealogy of all those actors involved. I think that uh, Sandra wanted to say something. Uh, firstly, I really thank you for this excellent panel which very much joins things that I'm working on. So I just wanted to pick up uh, on your last comment but also on what Nabil was introducing because basically uh, at that very moment uh, for three years I'm curating or I mean I'm curating a kind of research-based project uh, in Berlin which is called Violence of Inscriptions and which, which talks actually about a couple of things. It firstly talks about let's say well, that's now a question of terminology, but let's say systemic or structural violence that all of you have been addressing in your, in your presentations. But it also talks about how actually this gap is between representation and experience, you know, and what kind of institutional challenge we face if we want to give space or if we want to give space for articulation for this kind of violence. And as you said very practically when you talked about also you yesterday creating safe spaces, but also like how to how to deal with this phenomena, you know, artistic or non-artistic, uh, which also um, either do produce very violent, explosive imagery, but that's exactly not, you know, what the point is, and also how to communicate with audiences and all of all these kind of um, all these kind of issues. So how really ethically, politically, but really also aesthetically navigate this difference, you know, between representation and experience uh, in these projects. And I was wanting to ask you if you could, well, maybe share strategies, you know? So how to, also very practically, how to communicate these, these things to a broader um, public. It's one of the crucial questions which we are struggling with, you know, like as a kind of like circle of like practitioners, thinkers. And, uh, you know, the thing is, like, I, I'm bringing like examples, like tangible examples, because what I want to stress and really like accentuate is that 
you know, it's not, I'm kind of fed up with like, you know, like this model of like representing political turmoil, you know, like in art, you know, like just uh, bringing the, you know, like blurry, you know, shaky recordings of a demonstration to the gallery. You know, I am not interested in it at all. But uh, I can see quite a number of very like beautiful and powerful practices which don't materialize as a kind of uh, it's kind of hammered you know like image and forced image which might be shown in the in in the museum so th there are like two two kind of two kinds of practices uh, there's there's a number of 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 uh, like activities and also like objects also like things uh, which are not that uh, uh, straightforward, they're more like enigmatic and uh, mysterious and they might be also beautiful, it's, 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 it's quite common. But on the other side you have pr uh, practices which don't materialize as artworks. And this is, uh, this is also, I think they're very exciting because it it's, it's requires a new way like of like dealing, handling with it as, a, as an institution. You know, what are you doing with uh, uh, such yeah, like forensic architecture is a, is a, is a, is an amazing example. You know, do you want to like have their films in the collection? Like, is it the aim, the real aim of like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this, you know, practice, or do you want to yeah shows? Why not? Because it's like a way of disseminating certain ideas, certain solutions, like delivering, uh, also like delivering the evidence. But uh, it's a it's 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 it requires like a way of like. You know, it's, you have to recalibrate the apparatus, you know, or like institutional apparatus. But it makes me thinking also about us, like art institutions, also like performing violence, you know, like like we might be also like violent uh, kind of creatures. Yeah, it's it's and, and it's, it's coming back to this. Uh, I, I I touched it like upon like shortly like this question of. Uh, you know, like this dark matter, you know, like those invisible forces, invisible energies in the art communities, which we kind of, uh, which we have excluded, you know, like it's because we are, you know, like a bunch of experts or like guards or, you know, like, uh, or pr just, we are just privileged to, to select and uh, the, and in, in our times, it might lead to like creating enemies among like potential allies you know like <laughs> this is this is this is quite problematic but i know it's like also like coming back to your question you know i can see like uh quite a number of new super interesting like visionary practices which cannot be embraced cannot be captured by museums and uh they don't represent they this is like yeah this one to one scale artistic practice they don't represent something they don't bring like the scaled down models of 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 political struggles but uh, they 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 act there they're like in this environment they are embedded there but the thing they are so well camouflaged that we cannot sometimes notice them and they are like our radars are not calibrated to detect them you know so this is also like a way of uh, you know uh, thinking about an, an art institution as a kind of uh, yes as a, as a greenhouse you know it's like about this about some days about like cultivating ideas uh, and uh, you know think about uh, 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 no one, no man is illegal organization. Yeah, it's like it's it's it was initiated during Documenta. You know, nobody remembers, but it was like an artistic uh, initiative, and it got somehow bigger, more independent, and it's kind of like it uh, cut off this uh, umbilical cord. Yeah, we discussed umbilical cords yesterday. So it's like independent. It's an independent like being now. Um, can yeah. can I yeah um, just Sandra? because uh, I felt also it was an extremely clear panel um, also in relation to this notion of representation and strategies uh, because I think you all addressed non-representational art and that was extremely clear like you mentioned how art could influence the form of protest with but never representing in a way directly the issue. And then Eric Baudelaire's film, which I know you haven't seen, 
is exactly non-representational. You never see the, the so-called terrorist figure in the film. So it's just a landscape, it's the flow of images. And um, yeah, in a way maybe that's, that was what I found very strong in the panel, how art can be very political with, but never representing. One more sentence that, you know, instead of like making kind of cataloging like uh, forms of resistance, like different forms of resistance in the museum, what is very much interesting is also like the resistance of a form, you know, like a form which might be like a poem or like a, a, a symphony or something, you know, like this kind of established, refined form which uh, is resistant to be changed, but it, which might be still useful. As this example with the banner, you know, you have something really like, yeah, classic, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, it's a very efficient tool. Yeah. Uh, I'm not super familiar with um, uh, the work of Polly Higgins. I just know a little bit about it. And what always, to me, is maybe the, 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 the biggest conundrum of the question whether actually uh, a law on ecocide is the, the most appropriate or most efficient way to address these issues is because it relies on the you know, normalized understanding of those four already existing uh, crimes, right? The four big crimes against, against peace, which are essentially uh, also a sort of a strange kind of gradient, right? So you have genocide, you have crimes against humanity, war crimes and aggression or something like that, right? So if you think about that and then comes the ecocide, which is a new thing, as you said, only after um, 72, and all of these previous crimes, as, as uh, Nabil was saying, uh, with Lemkin's uh, proposal, entered through the Nuremberg Tribunal into the kind of the arena of the, of the international law. But there is, you know, one, and this is something that I, you know, discussed endlessly and, and worked on endlessly also in, in my work with uh, the monument group in, in Bosnia around the Bosnian genocide, is where, you know, how do you actually establish the intention, right? Because, you know, if you think about what is the image of genocide, it is always the image that comes after the fact, right? But in order to establish uh, and, and, and file a crime of genocide, you have to establish the intention, right? You have to have the, the proof, right? that the Serbian uh, forces at that moment in Srebrenica wanted to commit this crime, right? And how do you, if you follow this logic, right, which is essentially in terms of the gradients of cr crimes against uh, peace, the four that I named, if this is the logic that we should be applying towards the, the echo side, to me this is, you know, falls into the same trap, so to say, right? So it's always, you know, the victim that has to be seen at the end, and then it's always post festum, so to say. Whereas with, with, the, with the climate change and the ecocide, this is something, you know, radically different because we see it's going on, right? So it has to be a pre preventive law rather than um, reactive, right? And so, I don't know, it's, it's more like a comment than a question, I guess, for Nabil, uh, but was wondering how you, who know far more than me about this now, would comment. Uh, well, first of all, um, yeah, I think that was, that was, you know, this is the way I framed it, you know, like two omissions from, from international law, and, and i.e., the, the term from the beginning was, was diluted, right? So, so, so again, these are, like the, i.e. the term genocide. So, you know, only physical genocide is recognized, not the, not the <laughs> cultural one, as Lemkin had proposed. Um, so, uh, you know, which brings up questions of, yeah, you know, what then could be, you know, but according to existing laws, the, the, the a criminal investigation can only look at, uh, you know, evidence that's, that's in, in relation to physical genocide, physical destruction. Uh, but that's, that's not perfect. By, by, uh, uh, at all, right? But it that's. To me that it's only like uh, it, it appears because we know that just to make another convention, mm -hmm. not change anything, mm -hmm. like because UN conventions 
don't really change anything, right? But how? Yeah, but 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 it's. But it's also a question of um, uh, um, not sort of a, a technical, you know, understanding necessarily, you know, but uh, but one that is about justice, right? Uh, and in a way, uh, ecocide, you know, you know, it's it's the way the the reason it has been really you know endorsed by the environmental justice movement, right, uh, is because it's 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 they don't see it. it I.e., the term is not legally entered. But it's 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 widely used, uh, and be, because of of those uh, um, aspirations that it has around climate justice, around uh, uh, around um, something that that will protect the earth, uh, not only look at it uh, as a as a as a dead body, even though we have plenty of that going on, right? So you know, um, so so yeah, I mean, in a way, I, 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 uh, um, I'm I'm. Uh, I'm trying to be uh, uh, a little bit um, narrow-minded sometimes, and I think that's useful for me to, to sort of focus on, on, on criminal law or international criminal law and, and not sort of, you know, continuously expand it also to, to you know, many other fields. So um, uh, what, what constitutes the elements of a crime, right? Uh, which interestingly is taken from uh, the uh, ban of uh, chemical or chemical weapons in, in conflict, so so those same um, so they so same kind of uh, elements are used in 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 establishment of ecocide, which is a, a kind of durational, you know. Uh, uh, so, so in that sense, uh, you know, it is not a, a weather event, but something longer longer term. Perhaps right. It's also about uh, um, has a spatial in scale, 200 kilometers or or, or more, um, and and uh, a couple of other ones which I cannot remember right now. But those are the temporal and the spatial sort of you know dimensions. But what's interesting, right, is is in the legal debates, uh, this intention is 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 a, is a very important sort of aspect, of course, uh, and the the. And there, there is a legal debate around actually um, removing or not including intention, you know, within that within that causality, uh, which um, um, which is yeah, it, it's it's also then a, a kind of departure, right, from from uh, um, the criminal intent that 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 we recognize uh, um, otherwise. Um, I think that's that's. Uh, I think those are those are that's an important sort of distinction or, or difference to sort of uh, um, sort of grapple with, uh, given right that, for instance, um, um, you know, corporations are are, are you know, polluting and, and you know you know plastics and and you know many other sort of aspects right. Um, so so yeah, I, I I I agree. So thanks for bringing out those two two points. Uh, which was that ar around the point of the intention, and what was the other one? The uh, well, just basically there is space and uh, you know the the the, the, the scene that is actually not executory <laughs> 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 from the gradients of uh, destruction of human life towards <laughs> because because I am not sure that that you know the pronouncing something an ecocide works because it resides in the same logic that these others did. Yeah, but but the thing is that the, the the crime of genocide and and the international forum that exists to 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 address it um, is also you know like it's 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 strong you know it's not all law is bad you know like it 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 works. Maybe to, to can I extent, contribute right? to this because I would like to actually um, you know point to the fact that. This morning at the um, International Lawyers Association, they were discussing exactly that, you know, that with changing environmental conditions in the Anthropocene as well, and, you know, with ecocide becoming one of these possible categories, of course, new laws are needed. And um, so what I think is also maybe relevant to this, to this discussion is that uh, within these changing climatic and planetary conditions, certain... Um, modes that we take for granted in the kind of Western Cartesian division, um, like determinacy, uh, separability, and sequentiality, which is actually what Denise Ferreira da Silva um, 
mentions, they um, collapse. So there's no causality necessarily any longer between before and after, or it's not distinguishable with the time scales within which we operate. So, you know, perhaps that is something that needs to be taken into account, like the whether intentionality can actually be a, um, you know, a category within a discussion like that, or whether this needs to be rethought completely. I think uh, with, with all of ecologies, and the next panel will be again like on like ecology, ecology, uh, there are more than three ecologies, so we can't forget the mental one, like mental ecology. Uh, we can't forget that we have uh, uh, these weapons, like these totemic weapons in our hands, which are, uh, we call them obviously metaphors. Gilles Châtelet, I think you can, I'm not French speaking, so uh, he calls it, it's, it's a martial art. Because I mean, metaphor, it, of course, it depends in, 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 in the hand of whom it is. But the metaphor is a, is a very, is an extreme amplification uh, thing. So I think we, we really have to have on our mind that we are not automatically better than others. And might be we even uh, can start a certain processes which, what my close friend uh, in Prague with Havranek started already and it's like institutional therapy instead of institutional critique. Of course it's like very playful <laughs> and, and it sounds like esotericism but, but I think it, the, with all of wars which we face, uh, different kind of wars which we face all around the world, we have kind of like a new form of linguistic war as well and I think each of us has a certain, you know, position uh, and possible function there, you know, like speaking about like what we can address, like what can be, what can be our action. So. Just a short comment again, not a question, but a comment. But I think um, in a way the, the interesting parallel that you brought up between, let's say, ecological condition, political condition, is really something, um, you know, that stayed with me in the sense that Maybe the paradigm shift is not only happening in the area of ecology, but equally in sort of this, let's say, social political realm, in the sense that, um, you know, the sort of promise and certainty of a form of stability, if not peace, right, that we, our generation at least, grew up with yeah, as a sort of a stability for a future, for some for form of a betterment of the world, and so on and so forth. Yeah? Let's, somehow uh, it was part of our backbone and our luck. And, uh, you know, if, if we look into the future we are about to create, and certainly on a political level, we know that these, let's say, turbulences seem to last longer than just the office of uh, a president, let's say, right? That these yeah. changes, when they're made and when they're implemented, take a very, very, very long time to undo. Eh? So in that sense, this sort of turbulence might be a, mo a longer lasting weather phenomenon. <laughs> um, and so if, if that sort of longer lasting phenomenon is, is, is uh, the paradigm under which our institutions you know, need to operate, and I guess this is kind of the question we've looked at in, in the institutional realm. Um, I think what, again, what, what questions and, and what practices do we do we have yeah, in those very long you know because the short-term strategies that we had developed they were all about kind of underground you know sort of mulling around or maybe civil protest or maybe sort of using the, the arts community as a potential forum of resistance and so on yeah we had little sort of tricks to play along with because um, yeah, these short-term phenomena mm. sort of seem to dissipate uh, sooner or later. Um, but you know, how do you keep this, um, let's say, constellation um, alive when the future so you see? I, I absolutely agree with you. If I may add a footnote, um, I think that we have a reason sort of uh, prove that the nation state or the classic governmental apparatus of the nation state is not at all interested in peace, nor in Colombia, nor in Spain. I mean, in Colombia, we saw a referendum and the result was no to peace. And in Spain, you have the terrorists from ETA, which is over. There's a ceasefire, they're given all the uh, weapons, etc. There is a civil peace. There is a peace enacted by the people. They believe it's peace. The state says no. 
The state is not granted the political peace. So what we have to do is like splitting hairs, you know, get even more precise and may be able to actually operate distinctions like the ones Nabil has been working out so wonderful and then catalog different forms of peace, you know, because there are forms of peace that look nothing but nothing, nothing like peace. They are different forms of war. And maybe just a second comment, Sandra, in your direction, um, which is really more, more like a silly, not a silly occurrence, but an anecdotal occurrence, but it made me think a lot, which is when I sometimes take you know, friends or, or people uh, through the galleries and I say, oh, this is a political work and so on. They look at me and say, this is not political, this is social. You know, this, like for m most of the world, what we consider being political isn't political. You know, their sense of politics is, is tied to you know, parties and elections and whatnot. Yeah? Uh, and seeing you know, a bleeding child or, 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 I don't know, whatever, atrocities um, that we associate you know, with the imagery of, of, of the political, for them is, is, is daily business. I mean, this is not... I mean, for them, I don't want to say them and us, but you know, it's just sort of an interesting sort of anecdote, as I say, that the differences of reading images and terms that you, you attribute uh, when you sort of uh, remove yourself from, from a certain type of discourse. Well, I think that um, <laughs> we made it. We made it, Sebastian. It was <laughs> Sebastian. You didn't. Oh, yes, <laughs> go, 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 go. Well, just, I was thinking about, uh, I'm like on? Yeah. You're on, you're on. Uh, <laughs> no, I just it's going to be recorded for your knowledge. <laughs> I, I wanted to connect uh, because uh, Thomas mentioned this uh, kind of violence and the gallery and the museum and like, this notion that your, my, your friend might be like killed during the opening. I just wanted to <laughs> share this little, little fact from the uh, history of Poland. Like our first president, Gabriel Narutowicz, was assassinated during an opening of uh, an exhibition at the National Gallery in 1922 by a painter, a bad right-wing painter. So it's quite a legacy. <laughs> Leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. 